So, I'm Georgia Rackerson. Uh, I'm a researcher, and uh, as thank you for that really great intro, Danny. I'm going to talk about what I call internal UX. Um, you could rephrase it differently. Um, I'm going to describe what that is, give you some case studies of how I've done that in organizations, um, and then actually give you some tips for doing it yourself in, the, in, in whatever organization that you're working with. So, what is internal UX? In plain English, designing good experiences for people who work at your company. Research methods are applicable across a whole organization, and there are some really good benefits that you can take away from doing this. So I'm going to talk through some of them, then get into some tangible examples for you. So the first thing is, internal UX can improve your business. Every organization has some sort of key metric it's trying to improve upon all the time, whether that's sales, engagement, or something else. Um, and the people who impact those metrics work within your organization. So when you apply research looking at the processes, the way that people communicate with each other and collaborate, you can actually move the needle on those metrics. Another bit about uh, improving your business is that a lot of organizations are quite hierarchical, top-down, and uh, information is good at coming down, but not so good at coming back up. So this is a great way of um, pooling ideas from the widest group of people. Promoting research. Um, it's really important to get visibility of uh, the work that we do. Normally, when we talk about user research, we're talking about the end, the end user, the customer who we're trying to sell product to. And uh, that means that it can often be invisible to the rest of the organization. It's kind of this activity that happens in a black box over here, and then there's a deliverable, oh, we did some research and found this thing out. Okay? But if you can actually do it on the people who are going to hear about it, this really raises visibility, increases um, respect and appreciation for how it works. And the next thing is developing cohesion and satisfaction. Employee satisfaction in an organization is really important. It's usually measured with some kind of quant metric, like a survey that happens at some point, with an average number at the end. I know that's been my experience at companies that I've worked at, especially larger organizations. Um, kind of treated like uh, quant data instead of qual. Uh, and when we can actually understand what the day-to-day is like of our employees. Not only can we make it better for them, but we make them feel cared for. We've listened to them, and they've been part of the process of improving it. So um, you can build really strong um, relationships based on collaboration doing this stuff. This is how I actually started doing uh, internal UX. So at a company I, I worked at, um, we had an initiative which was to be more accessible. The research team supported the design, to te design team to be more accessible to those designers. So we set up re research hours. And research hours was basically an hour a week, I would just be available. And designers could come up and talk to me about anything research related. So I made a sign that looked a bit like this. It said, the researcher is in, psychiatric help, five cents. And I sat in the middle of the, in the office, really, really big open plan office, and uh, sometimes people would come up to me, sometimes they wouldn't. I could just get on with my work then, that was fine. Um, but uh, so designers were coming to me, but there was an unexpected outcome of this was that other departments in the organization would walk past and go, ha, huh, that's really interesting. What exactly is it that you do? Ha, huh, hmm, can I set up some time with you? So this is what started the conversation, was being highly visible and accessible, like, like treating it like, just come and talk to me about anything. You know, research can be a really great um, tool for, you know, researchers can be confident, can be friends, can be uh, counselors, and uh, that's kind of what we did here. And that's what got people open to the idea of, huh, maybe I can use your help to solve a problem I have in my team. So I'm going to talk through some case studies. Uh, there's three of them. First one is about improving the onboarding experience for new employees. So the, this is the problem. How do we make sure our new starter joining the team gets the best onboarding experience? So uh, two teammates from a particular uh, department in the organization came up to me and said, we've got someone starting in two weeks' time. I have no idea if the process that we have for onboarding them, that we get given from HR, that all these meetings are already put in their calendar, we don't know if that's actually uh, the right thing for them. Could it be improved? 
Um, as with all classic research requests, they needed the insights immediately because this person was going to start really soon. Um, and I think this request highlighted some of the blind spots that exist in organizations. Okay? HR organize onboarding for new employees, but they're not looking at what's the experience of the first four weeks. They're looking at how do we uh, retain this, this person this year and next year, whereas the teammates had different goals. How can we make sure this person feels really ca cared for in our team? So this was the approach. I ran, uh, set up a one and a half hour workshop, which I ran with the two stakeholders, the teammates who really cared. Um, and we invited five people to take part in this workshop who had recently joined the company in the last four weeks. Uh, that was quite important. You know, so it's, the experience was fresh in their mind. And then after the workshop had finished, we did uh, like a two hour mop up, myself and the stakeholders to talk about what we learned and what can we apply as quick wins. Now the reason we went for this particular method was it's, this can be done in a day. It's quite low maintenance. And we felt like an hour and a half was a reasonable time to ask of people who just recently joined the company to get together. So this is kind of what it looked like. We drew this big map on the wall um, and we got the participants to uh, tell us what, they, what, what things they had been made to do in the first four weeks, how they felt about that um, over the four weeks and how the feeling had changed as well. And then also to talk about how they thought it could be improved. Now, I'm not going to go into loads of detail about the findings from this project, but there were some things which came out which maybe you can uh, sympathize with. For example, people were so excited on their first day, really eager to get going. But by week three, if they had not got going, delivered anything, satisfaction was really low. Another thing is that some people didn't even have uh, access to their line managers in the first two, three, four days, left feeling a bit um, out, uh, out in the cold. Also, they just had all these meetings in their calendars that they didn't really know what was expected of them from out of the outcome of that as well. We got the stakeholders, my teammates, to, to run this workshop with me, um, to be really engaged, to ask why throughout and get a conversation going. So the outcome, short term, really excited teammates who felt that we've actually got some things that we can do now to make improvements. Um, and longer term, so what we did, we've, we presented our findings back to the HR team and they actually then rolled out some company-wide changes, really small, little obvious things that felt like no-brainers. Okay, thank you for doing this work. This is how we can improve that. Um, and we presented it to the whole company as well in like an all-win session just for visibility of it. Now, the way that this project could have been improved would have been to uh, have included HR from the very start. Um, it was kind of a distinct small project, one of the first ones I was doing that was working, researching what it's like being an employee at this company. Um, so maybe felt a little bit risky, I don't know, but in hindsight, we would have got much more buy-in and potentially could have taken this much further had they been involved from the start. So that's kind of how we change things after that. The next case study is understanding the needs of internal customers better. So, when someone asks me for help with accessing data, I don't know how much support they really need. In a very large organization, you have loads and loads of data, customer data, sales data, uh, marketing campaign, um, uh, data, you name it, website usage, right? And in some organizations, you'll have a central point where this is coordinated and they build dashboards to look at it. Yeah, and it's accessed by all these different departments in the organization. At Moo, which is the business car printing company I worked at previously, this is a project I ran there uh, well, my, with my colleague, who I'll talk about in a second. Um, the data warehouse manager is the person who's responsible for keeping this data clean, keeping it accessible. Uh, don't think of like warehouses in physical sense. This is a digital warehouse. Um, and what would happen is requests for access to data or help with something would come in through a ticket system. So I need, some, I need to know this. But the problem was is that the data warehouse manager didn't really have visibility on what they were going to do with it, actually how much support they needed, or whether their request was even the right sort of one. So he just didn't know how to serve their needs the best way he could. Um, so... We, my, my colleague, Alex Krasoziak at Moo, she, she ran this project. Um, she uh, did some interviews with multiple data users in the organization. So people from marketing, from finance, product managers, developers, you name it, anybody who needed to get access to this data. 
Um, and this data warehouse manager took notes, observed every single session. So he's getting visibility of the process and how that works. Then we created personas to aid understanding. And I'll just show you a few examples. So this is the kind of thing that came out of it. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on the content in it, but you can see that we're starting to address what are the needs of this kind of people? What are the pains that they have? How can we make improvements on that? And Alex actually produced four different uh, personas from all the interviews that they ran. I think they ran about 20 interviews, so it was quite deep. But these interviews were like one-on-one, -on, -one, on a sofa, in the office, easy to organize, you know, low impact in terms of your resource. You can just schedule it in around your other work there. Um, and these are the outcomes. So um, we created four different personas. And they, um, not only did the data warehouse manager have all this excitement about, oh my God, I can actually understand people and it's not just data, it's, it's this qualitative um, insights around it, understand their users, um, but we also created a triage system for when people were submitting tickets, they could self-identify with which of these buckets they were. So that's shortening the journey that this data warehouse needed to take to not to understand what they really needed. And the last one is making sure the technical solution we've chosen is the right one. It's my favorite one. Um, we've chosen a new system that every developer is going to have to use. How do we know it's the right system? Brilliant solution before understanding problem situation, which we've all dealt with before. So in this particular company, um, they were trying to find a better way for developers to uh, re uh, write and release their own code without going through this kind of bottleneck that existed. And there were 80 engineers in the company, 80 developers. So that's quite a lot of people to have to onboard to something brand new um, and get them all bought into the change. The CTO uh, tasked the technical leads with finding an off-the-shelf solution for this problem. It's going to cost a lot of money as well. So they decided, well, they picked one out of a few that were available. Um, but the problem was there wasn't enough trust that this was the right one to go for. Uh, is they were going to spend a lot of money on it. It's going to be a massive upheaval for the organization. So how do we know we've chosen the right solution? What I did was I thought, well, okay, this is not ideal. I'd rather start at what the needs are and then get to the solution. Um, but just kind of went backwards a little bit. And, you know, doing this and talking about that, that this would, be, would have been a better way to do it, is in itself great education for the stakeholders that you're working with. So um, I thought that if we could run some interviews and workshops with engineers to understand what their world is like now, determine what their needs are, then we could match the needs to the chosen solution and check it worked. Okay, that's the logic. It kind of worked. Right, so um, these are the steps for this project. I listed assumptions, did some preliminary interviews, uh, group workshop, and then out of the group workshop, we had these prioritized needs that we could check the solution against. Uh, the listing assumptions was really important. I'm like a fairly technical person, but I'm not a developer. And I was a bit concerned actually that how am I going to know what the hell they're all talking about? You know, they're going to use language that I don't understand, that they're not going to be sympathetic to the fact that I don't know as well. So I did this assumptions uh, workshop with uh, all of the technical leads who were the stakeholders on this project to understand what, the, what are they even expecting? What are they expecting to find out doing this? Um, what language do they use as well? Then I did some preliminary interviews with developers and I got the technical leads to be there, do the note taking, so they're exposed to this process as well. And that was another way to check what is the world like of this developer and is it consistent across the few who I interview? So I get, I get a feeling I'm gonna get some useful stuff out of it in the group workshop. This was kind of the unknown, right, for me. I hadn't done this kind of thing before. Um, also, I, I was quite useful having a technical lead be the uh, note taker because if there was like terminology or language used that I didn't understand, I could kind of defer to them and just, yeah, okay, I get it, right? Uh, so just having like someone to bounce off was really useful. So then we group workshop and prioritized needs. And this is what the workshop looked like. So we had um, about 10 developers uh, all gathered together. We got them to plot what are all the things you do now when you're writing code and deploying it for the first time. What is that experience like? What are all the steps? Where, the, where are the squeezing, the bot bottlenecks and annoyances? Uh, how do you feel along that journey? And what do you think improvements could be? Um, how has it been done at other companies that you've worked at? Remember that your empl the employees at your company, your colleagues, have experiences at other places. So that we can draw on those as well. Um, 
we use, now engineers, developers are really solutions driven. That's, that they're meant to be, okay? But we didn't want them just to tell us what they thought the solution should be for their pains. We wanted them to describe why. So we use the job stories format, which goes like this, when I, something, I want to do this thing, so I can expected outcome, all right? This gets to the why, the need, as opposed to the what, which is the solution we're checking against. So here's a real life example, just to make this totally clear. So um, this was a real need. When I deploy a change that breaks something, I want to be alerted as soon as possible so I can take corrective action quickly. Okay, yeah, it's not rocket science. That's actually really useful. This actually became a really important uh, priority that, okay, then we can look at the solution and go, is it gonna provide a warning system for when something is broken, yes or no? Um, also, it's like a nice little side project on this. I did a customer experience map for what it's like being a developer at this company. Um, and like, what, what's it like now? Writing code, deploying code. Um, and this was actually, I printed it out really big and stuck it to the wall near the technical leads. Just as a reminder, this activity has been done. Please don't forget it. Um, but they, they actually started huddling around it and came to um, understand, actually, there are maybe other opportunities for improvements in the way that we engage with the developers at the company. Better commun communication strategy, even. Um, and really interesting part of this project for me was that um, after running the workshop, developers came up to me and said, no one's ever asked me how I felt. And I think that um, that says a lot, right? You know, we can treat, you know, data, data-driven people and code-focused people like robots in an organization, you know, as metrics. And they really appreciated this. And as that was a really good outcome because not only do we have the prioritized user needs, greater confidence in the solution, but these people who've been involved were bought into the solution because they've been involved in it. It's called the, it's cognitive bias called the IKEA effect, where you care about something that you took a part in building, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, they, this means that you're not gonna have as much friction when, when the big change happens and everyone has to make, has to do something new. Also, we understood what their reservations might be, what questions they had. Um, or concerns about doing something in a new way. And that informs the communication strategy for rollout. So when you do the big company-wide blog post, you already know what people might say about it and what questions they're gonna have, and you can preempt those as well. Cool, right, so get onto some tips now. Um, hopefully I have um, inspired you to think about some ways that you could do this in your organization. And I'll come, up, come on to this a, li a little bit. Um, but here are some tips for running your own. Firstly, you need to identify resource to do this. If you have, in, if you're an internal researcher, or an, a researcher in-house at your organization, then um, you're a potential asset for this. General UXers, designers with some research experience. If your organization or you feel that your team is lacking research skills, you can use this as a mentoring or development opportunity. And the reason is, the first time you do it, no one kind of cares because they don't know what the outcome's gonna be, right? It's not like really important research to do with end customers. You can do this as a nice, bespoke, internal thing that happens at the side and then shout about it afterwards. Finding the right project to start off is really key. So. Start with something small that can be achieved in a day. Um, look for real problems to solve that are actually going to add value. Um, and I would say, you know, if you, it's not so much here. I've said if you can't get buy-in. It's more like if you can't get enthusiasm for doing this the first time, just do it anyway. Use it as a team-building exercise. You know, it could be your fun UX team um, activity on like an off-site or something like that, or an on-site where you might do it in your office. Um, when you're doing it, you already have the research methods. There's nothing that you need to try for the first time that's new, okay? It's no different from running research with customers. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and also, these are logistically quite simple to deliver because if you think about it, your users, in this instance, are probably in your office. We've already heard that recruitment is a real pain in the ass. It is for me. And this, um, you don't, you know, you hopefully already have some sort of relationship or common ground with the people that you're going to be uh, using as participants in your studies. You know, they at least should be bought in 
to assisting you. They are motivated to do that because you're colleagues. And this can be done in, in house in an office, but also remote as well. You can do calls with people in, if you've got offices in other locations as well. Remember to make it really collaborative. So the stakeholders who you're working for, get them involved doing it. It's just, it's, it just feels good and it's, uh, it's good for them to get exposure to, to how this all works. When you've done it, make sure your peers shout about it. Uh, sorry, your stakeholders shout about it to their peers. So if you're doing a project with, for example, technical leads, um, get them to present that work back to the other technical leads in their, in their department. Then make sure you're shouting about it to the whole company, whether that's in like a company all wins meeting that happens at once a month, a blog, internal blog post, or even just an email. Uh, but make sure you get the word out there. And then if you've got some success out of this, and I promise you, you will, because starting research in any organization, whether that's customer research or internal research, it always uh, low-hanging fruit the first time you do this, right? So you're going to be able to come up with some great improvements to processes and ways of working. Then you can ask to get internal UX on the roadmap as well. If I haven't already convinced you that this is worth doing, there's a few more reasons. These are really fun, interesting projects. And you know, if you care about your colleagues and you have empathy for them and their way of working, you can actually improve their lives. And that's just a really great feeling. It's a nice thing to do on top of potentially working at an organization which is just trying to make more money from customers, right? You can actually do something that feels really worthwhile on top of that. Uh, if you, you may be used to people in organizations being hired as experts, so it's difficult for them to admit when they might be wrong. You can prevent people from doubling down on bad ideas by giving them the confidence to go, I don't know, but I know how to find out. And that involves coming to you. And you're going to get newfound respect for research. And if you're trying to convince your organization, there are some definite wins that can be made when it comes to improving KPIs, all those metrics um, that you need to improve on, higher employee satisfaction, caring for them, caring about the way things work, and getting them involved in the process. And also, you're just going to tap uh, knowledge from a much wider pool than just a few people at the top. Um, I'll just finish by saying an uh, interesting uh, thing that I've heard from a company I recently left. Uh, the head of research uh, contacted me to say, you know that uh, you standing, sitting in the middle of the office with the researcher is in sign. Uh, well, the CEO has asked how you've managed to make that so successful and is thinking about doing it himself now. So, um, you know, that's an amazing outcome, really, to say he could see that this was, this was a really good visible, a uh, really good mechanism for making yourself highly visible. Um, so, with that, um, that's the end of what I'm going to talk about, but I would love if you want to contact me on Twitter with any ideas that you have about uh, projects that you've got, and I'm around after lunch as well to have a chat. Thank you very much. Thank you.